Okay. I'm uh, pleased to welcome Michael Hines, who is a longtime friend and a friend of Collegium. Uh, about uh, when we started Collegium some 13 years ago, I remember speaking to uh, Tim O'Mara, the then provost at Notre Dame, and we were looking for suggestions of speakers. And there was someone I never heard of, and he said Michael Hines was absolutely someone we should have as a speaker. And he claimed that Michael was sui generis. Now I know that Michael has parents and a brother, so that claim is not particularly that's not true. Uh, but uh, we were pleased at that time to have Michael speak, and uh, uh, found that to be really wonderful. In fact, uh, we've often, uh, when we couldn't get the real person, we've used uh, DVDs and CDs for that, VCRs of Michael, uh, just for speeches. Uh, Michael is a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn originally, and was a seminary rector, or taught at the seminary at a Mac of Conception in uh, Long Island, then moved to the University of Notre Dame before he went with Michael Luckley, really, back to Boston College. And uh, now, likewise, his brother, um, perhaps also a silly generous brother, but his brother Kenneth is uh, chair of that department of theology at Boston College with him, and they've written and published together. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much, and thank you, Tom. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be able to speak with you this afternoon. Uh, I am not fully generous. I am my, my unique species, <laughs> but uh, I am the same genus as my brother. <laughs> um, the, uh, the topic that I'm going to speak with you about this afternoon is the sacramental vision of Catholicism. And the reason I want to emphasize that to you is because, obviously, there are many ways of being Christian. There are many important, valuable, insightful strands of the Christian tradition. The Anglican Communion, the various Orthodox churches, the Lutheran Church, the Congregationalist and Presbyterian traditions, all of which have immensely valuable insights into the Christian world. What is it that makes Catholicism Catholicism? What's the unique vision of the Catholic tradition? And I would suggest to you, it is its uh, notion of sacramentality. And to explain what I mean, I will give you Heinz's handy-dandy definition of sacramentality right up front. For our purposes, we will regard this throughout the afternoon as the truth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by sacramentality, I mean the principle that what is always and everywhere true must be noticed, accepted, and celebrated somewhere, sometime. If something is always and everywhere the case, then it can easily be overlooked. So it must be noticed, you have to recognize the fact of its truth. You have to accept that it is true, and you have to celebrate the fact of its truth in some place at some particular time. That's the notion of sacramentality. So I'm not talking, please notice, I'll be back to this in a little while, but I'm not talking about the great seven sacraments within the Catholic tradition, the major public rituals and celebrations of the church. I'm certainly including them under the notion of sacramentality, but I'm not exhausting the notion of sacramentality by those seven. There are, in fact, many, many, many sacraments, again, I will talk about what I mean by saying that in a little while. First of all, to get into this, I'm going to try and lay a very, very, very deep foundation, something about as fundamental as you can get in the Christian tradition, and that is, I would like to ask you to think with me for a moment about what we mean by the word God. As I said, you can't get much more basic than that in the Christian tradition. What do we mean by the word God? Now, the first thing to do is to throw out of your imagination uh, any version of Zeus. <laughs> I am not talking about a great big fellow out there someplace, older, wiser, stronger than the rest of us. That's Zeus. You can baptize Zeus. You can get Zeus to his first communion. But Zeus stays Zeus. That's not what the Christian tradition means by God. What we do mean by God is the mystery that grounds and supports everything that exists. The mystery with a capital M, 
that supports, that founds everything else that exists. There are, let me hasten to clarify that by saying, there are at least two ways we use the word mystery in the English language. One is the Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes, murder she wrote sense of mystery, uh, in which uh, we could only get all the data, the clues together, and assemble them in the right order, they click into place, and we say, ah, the butler did it, and the mystery is solved. I don't mean mystery in that sense. I mean mystery in the much richer and deeper sense of, well, let me give you my favorite example of it. Uh, it's taken from Alice in Wonderland, one of the most profound books, in my opinion, of the 19th century, as we usually happens when adults are confronted with particularly profound and insightful books, we turn them into children's stories. <laughs> uh, we've done that with Robinson Crusoe, we've done it with uh, Gulliver's Travels. My God, you mentioned to me Gulliver's Travels to kids. <laughs> it would be like saying to a child, yeah, here's a razor blade, play with it. Gulliver's Travels to children. Uh, and of course, we've done it with. Uh, the Alice books, when Alice went led through the booking class. Alice, I, I think among the many things the Alice books are about, are they are about the process of going through adolescence. You remember all the way through Alice at Wonderland, Alice is either too big or too small. You know, she's always shifting sides. It's once about the experience of every adolescent. The two great things every adolescent wants to do is to get away from home and then get back home. And to find out, get out of the situation of being, you're too big for that, you're not old enough for this, you know. Alice is always in between, wandering from home and desperately trying to get back. It's the experience of every adolescent. Well, you remember at one point in the first of the Alice books, in Alice of Wonderland, she bumps into the caterpillar. She is at this point, she tells us, an inch and three quarters tall. And she meets the caterpillar who is seated on a uh, mushroom smoking a, a hookah, a water pipe, blowing smoke rings. And Alice begins by asking him, excuse me, could you tell me how I might find the white rabbit? To which the caterpillar replies, puffing smoke in her face, who are you? And Alice says, Really, if you don't know where the white rabbit is, could you at least tell me how I can find my way back to the rabbit hole and get home again? Who are you? Now, of course, one of the things to remember about the Alice books is that Charles Dobson, the real Lewis Carroll, was a professor of mathematics and mathematical logic at Oxford for most of his life. And not surprisingly, all of the people that Alice meets in Wonderland are magicians. I mean, that's part of the fun of the book. They're all logical. It's Alice and the reader who aren't logical. Okay? Which is why we think they're bad, and they assume Alice, and presumably we think the reader is bad. Well, good logician that he is, the caterpillar is asking Alice to define her terms. Because every time she asks a question, she uses the first personal pronoun singular. How can I find the white rabbit? How can I get home again? And the caterpillar is saying to her, my dear, I cannot possibly answer your question until you define your terms. What is this I you keep referring to? Who are you? Now, I grant you that if you stop at a gas station for directions, you do not expect metaphysical argument. And so <laughs> one understands Alice's sense of frustration. But the caterpillar's question is not a foolish question. It may be odd in the context from our point of view, but it's not a dumb question. Who are you? Now, do not tell me your name, because we know what excellent authority in English that arose by the name of the name of Stella Sweet. Don't tell me where you were born, where you went to school, where you lived, who you're married to, where you teach. All of that is description. I didn't ask for description. I asked for definition. Don't tell me what a human being is. I didn't ask for the definition of a human being. I asked for the definition of a you. Who are you? And of course, part of the frustration, as St. Augustine knew 15 centuries ago, is that we don't have a good answer to that question. But I can tell you a great deal about myself, but I cannot finally, in any finished or exhausted way, tell you who I am. Not least because I'm not done being me yet. 
I mean, presumably, you can only give a finished definition of you as they close the casket lid. You've got to be done being you to give a final definition of you. And at that point, I don't expect any of us to be defining anything. Uh, the, the frustration is that we don't know who we are. We are, in the most profound sense, mystery to ourselves. Not just mystery to others, but mystery to us. And notice, this is not a, a case of, well, if we forget the data, the, who, what have you got more data on than you? Who has more data on you than you? Even in these days, the Patreon apps. The government no, doesn't have as much data on you as you. Um, the fact is that it's not a matter of getting more data, accumulating more knowledge. The fact that you simply cannot get a perspective on yourself. It's a little bit like if you're as nearsighted as I am. I've always said, if my life had been different and I had married and had children, the one gene of mine I would want them to inherit is the gene for nearsightedness. It is one of the great blessings of life. Do you realize that by doing that, I have put you all out of existence? <laughs> <laughs> it's the most magnificent defense. Uh, well, uh, if you're as nearsighted as I am, there are two ways that it becomes impossible to read something. One is if you hold it out here, because everything from my elbow out has vanished into the mist. And the other is if you hold it up here. Well, in a certain sense, that's like the two meanings of mystery. Some things are mystery because they're so far away we cannot get a bead on them. And some things are mystery because they're so close, they're so intimate, they're so much a part of us that we can never get a perspective on them. God is like the second kind of mystery. It's not a question of getting more data on God, and then we'll have it resolved. We'll know the mystery with a capital M on which everything rests for its being. The fact is that God remains sovereignly mystery. Now, that's a difficulty. And the difficulty is, how do you talk about mystery? Whenever I do the introduction course with new students at Boston College, the introduction to theology course, I tell them that all theology is done between two poles, and the kind of symbols I use for these two poles, these two limits on theology, are Ludwig Wittgenstein and T.S. Eliot. But probably, I would suspect that the most quoted line if there was a single sentence that could be the most quoted sentence in 20th century philosophy, it's the last proposition of Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. You may see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the last line of the Tractatus is of that about which we can say nothing, let us be silent. <laughs> or if I can translate that into my own terms, if you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. <laughs> well, you see, if you begin by saying God is sovereignly mystery, then we've said from the beginning, we do not know what we are talking about. We do not exhaustively know what we mean when we talk about God. If you do, God has ceased to be mystery, and whatever you're dealing with is some kind of blasphemous idol. But it's not God any longer. So if we begin by saying that we don't know what we're talking about when we talk about God, Wittgenstein's portion is, well then don't talk. Watch what you say. One of my dear friends and one of the, in my opinion, one of the most distinguished living Catholic theologians in the English language, Nicholas Lash of Cambridge, the other Cambridge, the Cambridge across the Atlantic, mm -hmm. uh, is, um, is fond of saying that theologians are, by definition, people who mind their language in the presence of God. That they are, by definition, people who are constantly aware of the fact that they don't exhaustively know what they're talking about. However, oh, let me point out, by the way, that this is, this is very ancient insight, this Wittgensteinian image. Uh, think of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. The first commandment Whichever version of the commandments we use, whether you use the one in Exodus or the one in Deuteronomy, uh, 
The first commandment of the Decalogue is, I, the Lord your God, have no strange gods in my place. Do not manufacture an image of God. Well, we're not simply talking about don't worship false gods like I suspect most of us, very few people today, are seriously tempted to spice up a few pigeons for Athena or sling the odd goat Odin's way. Uh, most of us are not going, when I was growing up in Brooklyn, I used to think, well, that's one commandment taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> not down, what is done. Uh, the fact is that the reason that that's the first commandment is because it's the besetting temptation for all religiously interested people. You see, if you're not religiously interested, you're not tempted to worship any god, let alone false god. It's the religiously inclined who will worship something that they think is God. That the, the, the image of God is not that we don't set up a, a, a statue. The, it's, be careful about the images that run around in your imagination, in your mind, when you talk about God. Uh, whatever comes into your head when you hear the word God is not God. However, however biblically grounded, however traditionally founded, however orthodox, however ecclesiastically approved, however rich, powerful, insightful, marvelous, it's not God. And you must not confuse the image of your imagination with God. That's the first commandment. The second commandment flows right out of it. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We've done dreadful things to the second commandment. We've trivialized it into, over the course of centuries, into a commandment against profanity. Yeah. Now, I want you to know I am against profanity. If anybody asks you what does Heinz think of profanity, he's against it. <laughs> um, but I suggest to you that Moses had a lot more on his mind than how colorfully the Israelites were swearing down at the foot of the hill. <laughs> the second commandment flows right out of the first commandment. If in fact God is sovereignly mystery, if your best image of God is not adequate to God, then for heaven's sake, be careful how you talk about God. Don't go nattering on about God like you know what you're talking about. Don't go slinging around the word God like you've got a clear and distinct image of what the word might designate. And you all do. You know, it's the will of God. Really? How in heaven's name would you know? <laughs> uh, uh, the, the fact is that we are always tempted to talk about God lightly, vaguely. The second commandment is not a com commandment against profanity, it's a commandment against limp theology and too simplistic preaching. It's about throwing around the word God lightly. So the first thing to know about God is that we don't know what we're talking about. If that's true, then isn't Wittgenstein's portion well taken? Shut up. And if so, I would now say to you, thank you very much, and you'll have the rest of the afternoon free. <laughs> But I'm not going to do that because, after all, this is how theologians make their bread and butter. I'm going to balance it by a second poll, and I'm going to use a statement of T.S. Eliot's to, uh, to sort of summarize this poll. Eliot was talking about poetry, not specifically theological language, but I think I can, without doing too much violence to it, adapt it to talk about religious language. Eliot said, there are those things about which we can say nothing, but before which we dare not keep silent. There are some things that you know you cannot say right, but they're simply too important not to say something about them. My, one of my favorite examples is from a, an early film, a particularly beautiful film of Woody Allen's. Uh, and as an old, as Tom, said I'm a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn, as an old New Yorker, uh, obviously Woody Allen is dear, near and dear to me. People elsewhere in the country think that Woody Allen makes comedies. New Yorkers know that Woody Allen makes documentaries. <laughs> uh, he just sets up a camera on the other west side and films what's going on. The rest of the country thinks it's funny. New Yorkers know it's life. Uh, well, in one of his earlier films, Allen plays a man, uh, middle-aged, who is in love with a younger woman when the film is played by Mario Hemingway. 
She has no notion that he feels any romantic attraction toward him, her at all. She just thinks of him as a very good, very close friend, somebody that she can turn to for advice and guidance and so forth. Um, and throughout the film, he's kind of tormenting himself on how is he going to tell her that he's in love with her, and should he tell her he's in love with her. And finally, there's a wonderful scene where, as, as they're in conversation about something else entirely, he, he can't take it anymore, and he blurts out, I love you! And immediately catches himself and says, no, 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 no. I love you. No, 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 no. I love you. No, 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 no. And he goes through about eight ways of saying those same three words. But the point of the scene, of course, is that those are three of the most happy words in the English language. The moment he says, I love you, he knows that it just sounds hopelessly inane. It doesn't begin to scratch the surface of what he wants to say to this woman. Wittgenstein would have said, then shut up. <laughs> if you can't say it, don't talk. But Eliot would say, I think very wisely, there are times that you have to try to say what you know can't be said. You've got to tell her you love her, but you've got to know in advance that you're never going to be able to say it right. You're never going to be able to say it completely. You're never going to exhaust what needs to be said. And it's within those two parameters that theology is done, that all religious language is used. We have to keep reminding ourselves we are talking about mystery, and that therefore a reverent silence might be very appropriate. On the other hand, we're talking about something that is so central, so core to us, the foundation that makes us to be at all, that we can't not try and say something about it. Um, often, when speaking to new students in theology at BC, like everyone who teaches in a core curriculum, you have to spend at least the first week justifying the course to the <laughs> students. You know. This is why you should be thrilled out of your mind to study philosophy. Oh, how happy you are to be taking chemistry. Uh, how delighted you must be to be doing theology. Uh, well, one of the things I say to them in that opening of the theology course is that, in fact, all of us are engaged with the question of God even if we never use the word God. The example that I give them is, I ask them, do you think, two questions, do you think that your life has a meaning, or a purpose, or an existence, or a goal, or a direction? And if you do, if you don't think life is just one, one damn thing after another, if you think it's got some meaning, purpose, goal, direction, do you think that that goal or meaning or direction is entirely of your manufacture, or at least in some part is discovered by you? And if you answer, yes, I think there's a meaning, and yes, I think it's at least partially there for me to encounter, not simply something I produce, then you're talking about God. You may never use the word God, you don't have to use the word God, but you're already engaged with the question of God. That in fact, we are always, on some level, dealing with the question of God. Uh, again, I quoted Nicholas Slash a few moments ago. Uh, Nicholas, when he retired from Norris Holt's chair of, at Cambridge, Nicholas was, I have to say, I'm not an envious man, but Nicholas Slash is a man who might do envy one great distinction. He was the first Roman Catholic to hold an endowed chair of divinity at either Oxford or Cambridge since Henry VIII. His immediate predecessor was John Fisher. Now I must say I kind of like being able to say my immediate predecessor the martyr. Uh, there's a certain cachet to that. Uh, well, but Nicholas retired as Doris Holt's professor at Cambridge, a wonderful Anglican theologian, Dennis Turner, who's just now coming to Yale, uh, was, was given the chair. And Nicholas was recounting to me uh, Dennis Turner's inaugural lecture as Doris Holt's professor at Cambridge. And uh, Turner rather nicely entitled his inaugural lecture, How to Be an Atheist. 
And he concluded by saying, so it is ultimately easy to say how to be an atheist, but very, very difficult to do. If you wish to be an atheist, you must discipline yourself very carefully and very stringently to find absolutely everyone and everything you encounter completely, utterly, crushingly boring. If you can do that, you can succeed at being an atheist. <laughs> but if at any point you bump into anyone or anything that delights you, terrifies you, awes you, astounds you, be very careful, you'll slip into the language of transcendence and then you'll be stuck talking to the rest of us believers. There's great wisdom in that statement of, of uh, Jeremy's. The fact is, we are all, almost all of us, always, engaged in God language. But we have to know that we're never going to be able to say it right. Well, how do you talk about something that you can't talk about? Well, the way you do it is the way in which the greatest masters of language, poets, have always done it. You pile up metaphors. That you use metaphorical language. Think of scripture. Think of all of the ways that God is spoken of in scripture. God is creator, God is king, God is shepherd, God is potter, God is captain of the vessel, God is uh, 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 warrior, God is general, God is mother, God is father, God is lover, God is spouse, God is lawgiver, God is judge, God is uh, rock, God is eagle, God is, God is all of these benefits piled one on top of the other. That's how all good uh, uses of metaphors uh, speak about the unspeakable. If I could give you my favorite illustration of this, think of Act 5, Scene 5 of Macbeth. You remember that in Act 5, Scene 1, we've seen Lady Macbeth for the last time, and wandering the halls, trying to get the blood off her hands. When Act 5, Scene 5, as the, as the uh, the rebellious Scottish Danes and the English troops are drawing closer to Dunn's name. Macbeth is giving all sorts of frantic orders. And suddenly there's a scream from off stage. And he sends his steward, Seaton, to find out what the cause of the, the outcry was. And a few lines later, Seaton returns and says to him simply, The Queen, my lord, is dead. Now, Shakespeare frequently does this at climactic moments in great plays. He'll tell you, point blank, he'll actually have somebody on stage say, language breaks down at this point. Hamlet, who remember, dies, saying the rest is silence. Um, well, Macbeth says exactly that. She should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word. And talk about that now. Now think about it with me for just a second. This is not only a man who has lost his wife. This is someone who has lost the only person who shares the guilt. The only person who knows the full horror of what has happened, of what they've done. He is now alone as no one else is ever, thank God, alone. And then Shakespeare, having said, we can't talk about Lady Macbeth. He does indeed, of course, go on to speak. He gives the great soliloquy tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty face. And you remember, damn that moment. He says as he comes to the end of the soliloquy, life is. Now think about it. Here we have the loathliest human being who has ever lived is going to tell you what life looks like to him. And how does Shakespeare do it? He piles up three metaphors. Life is a walking shadow. Life is a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. He, he, and he imaginatively asks you to look at this from three angles. It's a walking shadow. It's animated nothing. It's a poor player, Shakespeare and doubt we know lots of them. Bad actor gets out there, bumps his slides, bumps into the props. Uh, you know, the audience probably way to get him off the stage. 
Life is a tale told by many. I've always said anybody who's spent 10 minutes in ministry knows what this is. <laughs> and, you know, it's the person who buttonholes you and is all oh, excited, upset, they get all done and you say, I have a clue what they're not about. Uh, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying, what does it all come down? It comes down to the ship. Means absolutely nothing. Take those three perspectives, imaginatively extend the vectors, and where they cross, that's what life looks like to the loneliest person who's ever lived. You can't say it, but you gotta say it. And the only way to try and say it is pile up metaphors. That's exactly what we do religiously. We pile image on image on image to talk about what can't be talked about. Now, there's a problem with that, which I'm sure you know immediately. But you can't say anything that you want about God. I mean, clearly there are some metaphors that simply would be wrong. I mean, for example, within the Christian tradition, we would feel very uncomfortable about saying God is cruelty. God is hatred. God is injustice. God is evil. Well, what's the, the guideline that says, but you can't use those metaphors? You can use all of these, but not those. There has to be, as it were, a base metaphor, a ground metaphor, which says, as long as the metaphors you use are in accord with this, are reconcilable with this one, they're acceptable. If they're not reconcilable with this one, they're simply out of bounds. And the Christian tradition has that metaphor. It appears over and over and over and over again in the New Testament documents. But in its clearest, simplest, most concise form, it gets stated in one of the last documents of the collection written, the one we call the first letter of John. You will find it in chapter 4, verse 8, and then 8 verses later repeated in verse 16. And it is, God is love. If whatever other metaphor you use, as long as in some way it is ultimately compatible with the metaphor that God is love, is an acceptable way of thinking about God. Maybe helpful sometimes, not helpful others, but it's at least usable. If it cannot be reconciled with the claim that God is love, then it is simply ruled out as a way of talking about God, about the ultimate mystery that grounds and surrounds our being. Now, the word love that's used there, was, we're talking about documents written in Greek, the word being used is an unusual word in Greek. It is not the ordinary, the most common word that we would translate today as love. The most common word in Greek for love is eros, from which obviously we get words like erotic. And as you might suspect, that suggests sexual love, but it's not only sexual love. It's a love that finds satisfaction in the person or thing love. So certainly it includes sexual love, but it's also things like if somebody says, I love tennis, I love uh, Shakespeare, I love Boston cream pie, and as you can tell by the look of me, I do. <laughs> if you want to see Eros come to be with me bakery sometime, <laughs> I can spend hours just getting my fingers play over the eclairs. Uh, the, uh, uh, nothing wrong with Eros. Eros is splendid. Eros is wonderful. Eros is great good, but it's not the word that the first letter of John employs when it wants to say God is love. That phrase that we translate as God is love. It is not another word that we translate as love from New Testament Greek would be philia. We get words like philosophy, philanthropy, Philadelphia. Uh, philia is a love of companionship, friendship. It's really a subheading of Eros. I love the, the company of this person and find great happiness and satisfaction in her or his company. That's feeling again, wonderful thing, friendship. But that's not the word that's used. The word used is agape. And agape is a very, it's not a common word. It's not unheard of in, in other sources in the New Testament, but it's not a common word, it's a somewhat odd word that they chose. And the connotation of agape is a love that 
prophet seeks nothing from the person who will take love. It's not about the lover finding satisfaction at all. It is, if you want to use somewhat different language, it's other directed love. It's a love which is entirely interested in the good of the beloved, not in the good of the lover. That it's entirely other directed, which is why I like to translate it, because love is such a casual word for us in English. I like to, you, to translate it as self-gift. It's the gift of the self to the other, seeking nothing back, not even gratitude from the other. It is simply the gift of the self to the other. God is self-gift. That's what we're claiming about God. Now there's all sorts of things we could say about that too. Could explore that for, in fact, really in many ways, the whole Christian tradition spills right out from that claim that God is love, uh, is self-gift. Notice, I just point out one thing in passing, I haven't spent any time in this war, but I just point out to you, notice that what it's saying is that if you're trying to understand the meaning of the word God in the Christian tradition, it's much more like a verb than a noun. It's not the name of a lover, it's the name of love, which is an activity, a relationship not a person. And if you say to yourself, well, this is, that's very strange, I'm not sure I've heard that, that sort of thing about God in the Christian tradition. Well, yes, you have. Certainly, we, in most of the Christian traditions, we use it all the time. Every time we say we're doing something in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We don't say we're acting in the name or doing something in the name of the One. We say we're doing something in the name of the relationship of the Three. That God is more a relationship than God is a, a, a member of a relationship. God is not simply Father or Son or Spirit. God is the relatedness of Father, Son, and Spirit. Nobody ever explored this, in my opinion, more brilliantly in the Christian tradition than Augustine 15 centuries ago. Augustine, who was always a good pastor, was always, at the, always underlying Augustine's concern is how do you preach this stuff? And, uh, one of Augustine's concerns is, he said, point blank in his great work, De Trinitate, uh, well, we've got this language for the Trinity right there in the New Testament. Go baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And Augustine says that's wonderful and it's great, but we reference it. But it's not always very helpful when you're trying to get people to think about the Trinity, to use Father, Son, and Spirit. And he sets out to see if he can find other alternative sets of terms that might be more helpful for preaching and teaching. And he comes up with two that he particularly likes, but it's actually the second one is the one that he then uses all the time, so that obviously was his particular favorite. He suggested first that instead of Father, Son, and Spirit, one might speak of God as the giver, the recipient, and the gift given. That from all eternity, God is giving, from all eternity, God is receiving, and from all eternity, God's what's given. God is the giver, the recipient, of the gift given. Or, and this is the one he really likes, God is the lover of the beloved and the love that unites them. That from all eternity, God is an explosion of self-gift. God is endlessly giving God's self to God's self, and God is what God gives. That God is an endless explosion of self-gift. It's an enormous way of exploring <laughs> the notion of agape. That God is least broadly understood, the least inadequate metaphor is self-gift, is love for God. Now, let me develop this in a slightly different way. Let me ask the question, and of course you recognize from philosophy days uh, that this is the question that no one less than Martin Heidegger thought was the beginning of all philosophical reflection. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything? Why the Big Bang? Why not the Big Silence? Why is there something rather than nothing? And the Christian tradition's answer to that claim is an extraordinary one. It's a very radical one. One may not accept it, once people have not accepted it over the course of the last 20 centuries. 
but it's certainly an interesting claim. The Christian tradition's answer is, there is something rather than nothing because it's loved. Everything that exists, exists because it is loved into being. That's the reason for creation. When we talk about creation, we're talking about the universe. By the universe, we mean everything in the world that isn't God. God, everything that exists that isn't God. God is the foundation for all that exists. Everything else that exists because it rests on that foundation is the universe. Or to use more typically religious language, is creation. Now you see, there are two things that God, God doesn't need creation. I teach, as Tom mentioned, at Boston College, which is like Holy Cross, a Jesuit institution. And so, those of us who teach in Jesuit institutions or better dealt with the Jesuits know the great Jesuit motto that one acts on my Lord and me, Gloria, for the greater glory of God. And that's a wonderful and inspiring statement about our motives for acting. Theologically, it's not a very good statement. However, God doesn't need greater glory. God's got tons of glory. God's got closets full of glory. God doesn't know what he's going to do with all the glory God's got. God, it's like years ago, my uh, sister told all of my friends and relatives that I occasionally, about six times a year, have a glass of, uh, of Courvoisier. Of, uh, well, I have every birthday, every Christmas, every Easter, every nation anniversary, I get bottles of Courvoisier from the family now. My niece and nephew's great-grandchildren will celebrate the christenings of their great-grandchildren <laughs> of all my old school There is no plus. I mean, if I attempted to drink one-eighth of the stuff, I'd have been dead of cirrhosis of the liver years ago. Um, <clears throat> but God is rather like that with glory. God's got more glory than God knows what to do with. God, is not, God doesn't need creation to tell God that God is wonderful. God's notice. God does not need creation to tell God God is great. God thinks so too. Uh, God doesn't need creation at all. God gets nothing from creation. If God created to get something from creation, then God would be Eros, not a God. Man. God creates not because God gives gets anything from creation, but so that God can give something to creation. And what is it that God gives? Well, there are really only two possibilities. Either God gives something that isn't God, and that's simply another creature, more of creation. Or God gives God. God gives God's self. All of creation exists so that God can communicate God's self to it. Creation exists because it's loved into being. Now, let me quickly point out I'm not just talking about us. I'm not just talking about human beings. This podium exists because it's absolutely loved by God. Anything that exists, exists because it's absolutely loved by God. The difference between you and me and the podium is that we are the point in creation, at least so far as we know, the only point in creation, but who knows? We may get surprised someday in another world, another planet. Um, we are the point in creation that can know and either accept and say thank you or reject and try and deny that it is loved. Podium can't do that. But the podium is loved as absolutely as I am. You see, that's because God only acts in a godlike way. God doesn't do things a little bit. God doesn't sort of love this and love that a little more and love something else. God loves everything as God, that is to say, absolutely. God loves everything totally, absolutely everything. You, me, your pet cat, your favorite rhododendron, the further the little pebble on a moon circling the planet Neptune, a little crab scuttling the floor across the Pacific Trench. Everything that exists, exists because God loves it totally and absolutely. As, uh, the opposite of being loved by God is not being damned. The opposite of being loved by God is not being. 
If you're not loved by God, you're not hell. You're simply not there. St. Thomas Aquinas, always a safe bet to trot out when the Catholic theologian is speaking. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, in the Summa Contra Gentiles, the earlier and shorter of the two great Summa, he wrote, uh, raises in book four of the interesting question, if God is everywhere, is God in hell? And Thomas says, yes, yes, indeed, God's everywhere, God's in hell. And Thomas then asks, of course, the obvious next question, what is he doing in hell? <laughs> And Thomas's answer is wonderful. He's in hell loving the damned. The damned may never love back, but that's their problem, not God's. God is in hell loving the damned. If God's not loving them, they're not damned, they simply aren't. The opposite of being loved is not being. Uh, one way that I like to say this frequently in preaching, because it ruffles Catholic feathers, which is always a good thing to do with the pulpit, uh, is to say, look, uh, from, if I dare put it this way, from God's point of view, there's no difference between Mary and Satan. God loves them both completely. The difference is Mary's thrilled and Satan hates her. <laughs> but that's on their side, not on God's side. God remains sovereignly God. There's nothing you can do to get God not to love you. You see, if you could, what you would be saying is you're bigger than God. You can, if you can get God, who is love, to stop loving you, then you make God not God anymore. Well, sorry, you just haven't got that much clout. <laughs> you just haven't got it in you to not pull that one off. God remains sovereignly God. Everything that exists, exists because it's held in being by love. Let me introduce, by the way, you're saying to yourself, do you? God, where did sacramentality disappear to? Uh-uh, there's a mountain to come over the bridge just when you gave up all hope. Like the cattle when it appears, when you have said to yourself, we are never going to see home and loved ones again. Yes, you are. Uh, let me get into it by introducing another bit of theological shorthand, which I have been cleverly and surreptitiously setting up all this time, and that is the word grace. What do we mean by grace? It is simply theological shorthand for God's self-gift outside the Trinity. What has been happening from all eternity within the Godhead, God giving God's self to God's self, the love of the beloved and the love that unites them, the giver, the recipient, of the gift given in Augustine's two images. If God gives God's self away beyond God, what happens is the universe. It comes into being because God calls it into being to love it. Um, what do you call that love of, which is God, that agape, that self-giving of God outside the Trinity? The theological shorthand for it is grace. That's what we mean by grace. It is God's self-communication to the universe. God's giving of God's self to God's creatures. If everything that exists, exists because it's loved by God, as I say, that may be an incredible claim, but that is the Christian claim. You know? I mean, as I, as I say to my students all the time, by all means, do, I don't expect that all of you are going to decide you want to be Christian, but if you are not going to be Christian, and you're going to reject it, at least know what it is you're rejecting. Before you decide this is bunk, know what it is we're claiming to say that it's bunk. Uh, that uh, G.K. Chesterton said this, as Chesterton said so many things, wonderfully and wittily. Uh, Chesterton said, there's one really good reason not to be a Christian believer, and that is it's too good to be true. Mm -hmm. That if you may simply say, thank you, I understand what you're saying, the whole world exists because it rests on, on the love of God. That's wonderful, I simply can't buy it. That may very well be true but at least we should know that's what we're claiming. That, that everything that exists, exists because it's loved into being. It's held in being by God's self-communication. If we use the theological shorthand for a moment, that's exactly the same thing as saying everything that exists, exists because it's in grace. The whole thing rests on grace. 
It's grace from top to bottom, from left to right. It's soaked in grace. It's dripping grace. It's grace all over the place. It's simply inundated in grace. The reason it is at all is grace. So grace is omnipresent. See, so remember, when we talk about grace, we're not talking about some sort of commodity. We're talking about the absolute self-giving of God. Well, as I said to you, God doesn't give a little bit and a little bit more. You can't, I mean, there was a time when I was growing up, certainly, that many of us as Catholics, at least in this country, spoke about grace as if when you get it, then you lose it, you can get it back, you can gain a little more. You can, you know, on Monday you had lots of grace, on Tuesday, ah, oh, you sinned and you lost grace, but Wednesday you went to confession, so you got grace back, and then Thursday, you know, made, you made a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, and God was just tickled and gave you a little lot of more grace. And, I mean, that is a purely mythological, that's back to Zeus. That's a purely mythological vision of grace. We're talking about the self-giving of God. You may accept it more, you may reject it more, but it's always present. It's everywhere. It's constant. It's all over the place. And, believe it or not, that's where sacramentality comes in. Do you remember what I offered you as the handy-dandy definition of the sacramental principle back at the very beginning of Bible box? You say to me, of course we do. We have hung on every pearl that is dropped from you. <laughs> um, that the sacramental, the, the, sac, the, the notion of sacramentality in the Catholic tradition is that which is always and everywhere true must be noticed, accepted, and celebrated somewhere, sometime. Well, what is it that is always and everywhere true? Grace! The whole thing rests on grace. All the time, everywhere. It's soaked in grace. Because grace is always and everywhere present, sometime, somewhere, you've got to notice it, accept it, and celebrate it. You see, it's precisely the things that we are always present that we tend to ignore. Some years ago, I got hit with a bout of Bell's palsy. And I couldn't move the left side of my face for some <coughs> weeks or months, including my, uh, I could blink. Uh, I had to, uh, throughout the day, periodically remember to push my eyelid shut and tape it down at night so that it didn't, my eye didn't dry out. Uh, all of the people on that side of the classroom used to think I was getting fresh with them. Uh, <laughs> I just tell them, don't flatter yourself. Uh, the, uh, well, the fact is, since I began speaking, all of you have been blinking. Now, unless this has been preternaturally boring, you have not been counting your blinks. I'm always a little reluctant to say that by someone at the back saying 4,600. <laughs> um, you see, because you do blink all the time, you don't ever think about it. Get bells faulty, and you can't blink, and all of a sudden, blinking becomes a big deal. Begin to pay attention to it. That what is always true is ignored. You don't think about the oxygen in the room. The only time you think about the oxygen is if it's starting to go stale. It's growing thin. Um, that what is always present will be overlooked. Unless someone or something calls our attention to it. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's like a birthday. You know, on a birthday, we tell someone that we love him or her. That certainly doesn't mean we love you today, the other 364 days of the year, we could care less about you. The point is, because we love you all the time, sometime we've got to tell you. We've got to celebrate the fact that we love you. It's like sacred space. You know, we say the chapel, the church, is a sacred place. Why? Because God dwells there and not the parking lot. God is not the supermarket. God is not the bank. God is everywhere, because God is everywhere, somewhere, we better pay attention to the fact. So we carve out the space, so that we will pay attention to it here. Uh, Sunday is the day of the Lord, as opposed to Tuesday. God never goes into the office on Tuesday. Uh, God golfs on Thursday. Uh, all time is God's time, so sometime we've got to pay attention to the fact. We set aside the time. Anything that gets you to notice, accept, and celebrate the self-communication of God, grace, which is everywhere. Anything that gets you to do that is a sacrament. 
There are, of course, the great seven public rituals in the Catholic tradition, but those are community sacraments. We all have our personal sacraments. I would hope that all of you who are married, that if not the, certainly one of the most important effective sacraments in your life is your spouse. She or he isn't for me. I'm not married to them. But they are for you. I hope those of you who are parents, that your children are important sacraments in your life. To your next door neighbors, they're those noisy kids who live next door. But to you, they're sacraments. There are occasions when you recognize the deep love which undergirds all that exists, the self-communication of God. We all have our own sacraments. Any person, place, thing, event, any sight, sound, taste, touch, smell that causes you to attend to the grace of God which is always and everywhere present and brings you to acknowledge it and to accept it and to celebrate it gratefully is a sacrament. Therefore, how many sacraments are there, at least potentially? How many things are there in existence? There is nothing that isn't potentially a sacrament. The most beautiful statement of this in the English language comes from the great 19th, in my opinion, comes from the great 19th century uh, Jesuit poet, Gerard Badley Hopkins, who in one of the, the next to last line in one of his most frequently anthologized poems, Hurrah in the Harvest, says it perfectly. If you remember that poem, and then if you've never read much Hopkins, you've probably bumped into that because, as I say, it's one of the ones that's always anthologized in any in a anthology of uh, 19th century English uh, poetry. Um, that uh, Hopkins is, at this point in his career, was teaching in a Jesuit boys' school in Wales. And the situation of the poem is that he's walking along, presumably from the school to the Jesuit residence, and it's now the end of the summer, the fall is coming on. And he's lamenting the passage of the summer and the coming on of winter. And if you've ever seen a winter in Wales, you would know why. Mm -hmm. the, the fog lifts just enough to let you see the mud. And uh, the, uh, as, he, as he's walking along, he suddenly finds himself saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at the colors of the foliage. Look at the joy of the people bringing in the harvest. Look at the way the clouds scud across with the wind blowing off the Irish Sea in this season of the year. This is really wonderful. Why am I so upset about what's gone, what isn't here, the summer, and what's not here yet, the winter? Why not attend to what is here at this moment, the harvest time, the joy of the, of the autumn? And the next to the last line of the poem is, these things, these things were here, and what the beholder wanting. You see, the foliage didn't change colors at that instant, or the, the harvest begin at that second. It had been going on. What changed was Hopkins. What was missing was someone to notice it. What was wanting was a beholder. The one as wanted is Hopkins. These things were here. What was needed was someone to notice it, to be a beholder. But you see, I suggest to you that the whole of Catholic tradition and life could be viewed as an enormous training in being a sacramental beholder. This is what you see in Catholic liturgy. I mean, the guiding principle of Catholic liturgy is everything in the kitchen sink, which is why everything is fair game. It's all dumped into Catholic ritual and worship. What do you like? You like music, we got music. We got solo, we got choral. We got organ, we got instrumental. You like you like dancing, we'll throw dancing. You like parades, we march in, we march out. You like that we dress up in special clothes, we wave banners, we ring bells, we you got some old sense of smell, we blocked incense at you, we give you something to eat, something to drink, we pour oil on you, we put you to bed when you get married, we put you in the ground when you die. Uh, we pour, I mean, Everything, we've got paintings, mosaics, sculpture, statuary, architecture, you name it. We drag it all in. Why? Because all of it's graced. It's all fair game. There's no part of it that you can say, no, 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 that doesn't belong in liturgy ever because that's purely profane. That's purely secular. Nothing is purely profane and secular. 
It's all resting on grace. The whole thing can get caught up in it. Indeed, in the sacrament of reconciliation, sin gets caught up in it. Even sin becomes something that we can celebrate. Uh, the Augustine's line that's quoted in the Exalted on Holy Saturday evening. Oh, happy sin of Adam! What a great thing original sin is, <laughs> Augustine can say. Why? Because look what it's brought about. It's given us Christ and Christ's life and death and resurrection, and here we are celebrating it by God. Let's hear it for sin. <laughs> uh, the whole thing is, em is embraced by grace. It all rests on grace. So all of it is fair game for liturgy. What is needed is to be trained to perceive the grace. You see, this is why in Catholic liturgy, think of baptism. There is no difference between the water of baptism and the water you took a shower in this morning, the water that you brush your teeth with this evening, the water that you made coffee or tea out of today at lunch. It's exactly the same water. So if this water can be a channel of grace, why not the water in your shower? And the answer is, yeah, why not? If this little bit of bread and wine can become the focus of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, what about the bread that you had with pasta last night? What about that Chianti you shared with friends? And the answer is, yeah, why not? The, the whole thing rests on grace from beginning to end, from top to bottom. If that's true, then how does it relate to us as educated, and how does it relate to the Catholic understanding of education? Quite simply in this, how do you begin to attend to things that are there? Remember, sacramentality is about noticing, accepting, and celebrating the reality of what is there, seeing what's there, being a beholder. How do you do that? How do you learn to be a beholder? Well, let me suggest to you, if I may, a line from one of the most Catholic Catholics of the 20th century, a man by the name of Friedrich von Hugel, who despite the very German-sounding name, was actually an Englishman. Uh, his, mother, his father was an Austrian, a baron and his mother was a good Scots lady and when his father died she brought the family back to England and brought them up in England so English was his native language. Uh, Van Hugo was uh, invited in 1902 to write the start of the last century to give a talk to a Christian students group in Oxford and uh, in the course of his talk to them which is really quite wonderful Von Hugo, I suspect, must have shocked these rather earnest young Christian gentlemen, and of course, probably the gentlemen present at the talk at those days at Oxford. Uh, Von Hugo asked them a rhetorical question. Who, he asked, in the century just ended, the 19th century, who would be the great example of asceticism? Asceticism, self discipline. Rigorous self discipline. Who would be the great example of asceticism? And of course, they immediately tried to think of various religious figures and so forth. He answered his own question, and it must have shocked them, by suggesting Charles Darwin. Because, said Von Hugo, here is a man obviously of immense gifts and intelligence and energy who rigorously and systematically subordinated all that intelligence, perceptiveness, activity, energy, to the painstakingly careful examination of the beaks of pigeons and the varieties of barnacles. That, said Von Hugo, is true asceticism. You see, asceticism is not about, uh, the last thing that asceticism is in the Christian tradition, it's about beating yourself up to make God happy. See? What a bizarre vision of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite apart from what it says about the s and proclivities of yourself. <laughs> uh, what a bizarre vision of God. You know? 
that somehow God is made happy by seeing the creatures God creates out of love treat themselves poorly. What is an absurd vision of God? The whole point about asceticism is about training oneself rigorously to deal with what is there, not with what one hopes, fears, dreams, desires, dreads might be there. It's about, I like to say, it's about not looking in the mirror long enough that you could start looking out the window. That instead of constantly gazing at oneself, at one, one's own hope, dreams, needs, that one begins to look at what lies around one. It's about trying to see the real, not just one's own reflection. That's what a cynicism is. It's about getting yourself out of the way long enough that you can see the other. Well, that, Von Hubel said, is what Darwin did throughout his career. He trained himself to try and see what was there, not what he hoped, dreamed, feared, wanted, desired, longed, uh, was nervous about being there, but what was actually there. You see, I suggest to you, there are lots of ways to cynicism in, in our lives. Marriage is a school for cynicism. I mean, all of you who are married to that far better than I. What is at nothing kills a marriage quicker than if one of the spouses insists on seeing of the other spouse nothing but the echo, the reflection of what he or she wants or hopes the other to be. I mean, it's about learning to see the other as that other, not just the one that I want to be there, but the one that really is there. It's necessary for all good parenting. It's necessary for friendship, is a school of asceticism. Paying the mortgage, holding a job, paying your bills are a school of asceticism. It's about learning to deal with what's there, not what you'd like to be there. And one enormously important, enormously fruitful, rigorous form of asceticism in the modern world are the sciences. The sciences are about helping us to see what is there to be seen, not what we would like to be there to be seen. And so the sciences are an enormous ascetical training. That's why my pupil would say, Darwin, who may have been the greatest scientist of the 19th century, was therefore also the greatest ascetic of the 19th century. So that all of the sciences are, from the Catholic, Christian perspective, a training ground in sacramentality. It's about learning how to see what's there, about how to become a beholder, a little more rigorously, a little more, uh, a little more carefully. This is true of, see, there's, there was, there's another whole way I could have gone at this talk, and the other whole way I could have gone at it was instead of developing it out of the notion of God and Trinity, to develop it out of the notion of incarnation. The claim that God has loved us so much that God has chosen to become what we are along with us. That God becomes fully human as we are in all things except sin, in the words of Scripture. Because if that's true, then the corollary to the incarnation would be that everything that humanizes, divinizes. If, in fact, you want to become more like God, then become more like Christ. And what is it that you and I and Christ share in common? Our humanity. So the more thoroughly human you become, the more like God you become. Whatever humanizes, divinizes. But the whole of education is an enormous process of humanization. That's what we're about. Anything that enlarges the mind, frees the will, expands the imagination, excites one's creativity, anything that makes you more intelligent, wiser, more creative, more loving, more free, more open, more imaginative, is therefore making you like God. That's what education is about. Which is why the Catholic tradition is interested in education. You see, the worst possible, the most brutal, misuse of, of Catholicism in education is to think that what you do is you run schools where you lure them in by teaching them 
physics and engineering and nursing and English and so forth, and you're really about trying to teach them religion. In order to get them to do catechism classes, we'll teach them all that other stuff. The reason for the Catholicism is engaged in education is because all of education is sacred. It's all about divinization. It's all about making us more like God. The whole thing is sacred. There is nothing, nothing holier about teaching theology than about teaching biochemistry. There is nothing more intrinsically holy about teaching scripture than teaching economics. There is nothing that is more sacred about one field than another. That all fields, anything that makes you more thoroughly human, anything that expands your humanity, deepens your humanity, is making you more like God. Which is why, obviously, the Catholic tradition has to be interested in and concerned about education. To conclude. The words that you've been waiting for. <laughs> Let me just take the final image from one of the people who has said this better than anybody else. He said everything better than anybody else, even Shakespeare, uh, uh, namely Dante. If you remember the last canto of the Paradiso, you remember 100 cantos, 33 in each of the three sections, with an extra one at the start of the of the Inferno as the introduction. You remember that. Uh, remember how it begins. Now, mezzo del cammino di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la derretta via era smarita. In, in the middle of the journey of our life, notice our life, not my life, our life. This is a story about us as much as a story about Dante. In the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself, you don't know how he got there, he kind of bumps into himself, as it were. He finds himself in the middle of a dark and obscure, an obscure, shadowy woods, where the direct path, the straight and narrow, was utterly obscured. It is the middle of our life's journey. He was 35 when he started writing the Divine Comedy. We remember that in Scripture, 70 is the sum of our years, or 80 if we are small. Well, if that's right, 35 is the midpoint. In the middle of our life's journey, it's the whole, it's an enormous poem about a midlife crisis. That he has found himself, he's in the middle of his life, and he doesn't know how he got there or where he's going. The whole thing is just obscure. I don't know how to make sense of this. And the whole of the great poem is going to be Dante making sense of his life, being helped to it by Virgil and by Beatrice to make sense of his life. And finally, when he comes to the hundredth canto, the thirty-third of the Paradiso, he attempts to do what nobody should try to do, as Wittgenstein wants us, um, namely to describe the vision of God. And needless to say, he fails. He just fails less than anybody else who's ever tried, in my estimation. He says that he gazed on God that was like an enormous, this is a familiar image, all the way back to Plato at least, it was like an enormous, incredible light. A light so bright that it burned his eyes. It was destroying his sight, and yet, oddly, it was strengthening his sight at the same time. It consumed his eyes and strengthened them, so that he could see more and more deeply into the light, until he realized that the light was, he's already on to the notion of prism, um, of, a, uh, of a prism that he realizes the light is coming from three concentric spheres, each of a different color, but which together make one white light. It is, of course, his image of the Trinity. And then he says, as he gazed deeper and deeper into that light, he bit by bit saw one who looked exactly like me. As he gazes into the depth of the light of the Trinity, what he sees is the humanity of Christ, which is, of course, the pattern on which we were made. Let us make the human being in our image and likeness in Genesis 1. So that he recognizes that at the center of the light, he and God are in an amazing way very much alike. And then, and as it passed by. Then I knew the love 
that moves the sun and all the stars. But what he then knew was that the whole thing is love. The whole thing is grace. The whole of the Catholic vision of education is helping people out of a dark wood where they could get lost in the middle of their lives without ever knowing how they got into it and leading them to recognize that the whole thing is grace and that what they share with God is their humanity. That is no small task. I congratulate all of us on being part of it. Thank you very much. Now, Tom tells me we have about 10 minutes for any question, comment, or observation. I'm delighted to. Yes. Could you comment on uh, how that notion of Dr. McCown can be removed? Um, is it possible to. So, dilute it. In other words, um, it, it just the thing it reminds me of the high school teacher who finds a Christ figure in every uh, story that you read, and, uh, and this is sacrament, and this is sacrament. I mean, I'm thinking also of your talking about your stories as a, as a teacher, and I, I teach theology as well, and students, well, it's all, it, it means nothing, because it's all sacrament, so it's, it's, it has no critical purchase in any exactly. way, it's all, it's just, it becomes sort of meaningless. So. Exactly. It's the difference between discerning the sacrament and imposing the sacrament. You know, I mean, if you move into a situation and say, see, that's a sacrament, there's a sacrament, there's a sacrament. The point is, let it surface from within. You know, it's about being a beholder. It's not, be, it's not about being somebody who goes in and labels things as sacraments. Like violating the first commandment, creating. Hey, exactly, you're creating, you're creating the image then. What you've got to do is let the image itself surface. It's, that's where we go back to the asceticism. It's not seeing what we'd like to be there. It's seeing what's there and getting people to examine it critically. Which means that we have to be very critical in examining our own Christian tradition. You know, we can't, we can't uh, uh, simply go, go around saying these things without recognizing that there are lots of reasons to reject it. I mean, very intelligent, very, Nietzsche wasn't dumb. Freud was not silly. Uh, Marx was no dope. Feuerbach was a very clever guy. I mean, they knew what we were saying, and they said, no, we don't agree. Well, that's very important. We have to acknowledge that and deal with that responsibly and carefully and respectfully. And not turn it into, ah, oh, if only they'd been a little smarter, they'd have gotten it. Or, ah, oh, if only they didn't really know what they would deny. Well, you should do exactly what it's out after. You know, we have to take that very carefully and very respectfully, but that very responsibly. Please. From this perspective, how do you talk about the grand evils that we've seen in the last while, like quite a while? That's a great question. Uh, the best, the best statement, in the sense of the most chillingly accurate statement about evil I know, comes from. I've, I've used two great poets today, Shakespeare and Dante, so we'll introduce a third. It comes from Goethe. It comes from part one of Faust. Now, if you remember part one of Faust, you remember the Faust story, you know, the man sells his soul to the devil to get the woman he loves, youth, wealth, power, a new lifespan, etc., etc. In Goethe's great version of the legend, uh, when Faust first summons up the demon, Mephistopheles, he asks Mephistopheles, who are you? And Mephistopheles gives two answers. The first answer is very deliberately on Goethe's part, cryptic. And Faust dismisses it as that. Mephistopheles says, I'm a part of that power that forever wills evil and forever does good. And Faust says, that's a riddle. I don't want riddles. Tell me plainly who you are. Actually, it's a brilliant answer. But you don't figure it out until you get to the end of the poem and then go back over it again and begin to find out what he's talking about. But the second answer is absolutely terrifying. 
that the South Vietnamese say, I'm actually German because it's so good. Ich bin der Geist der States verneint und das mit Recht. Denn alles, was in State ist wert, dass es zugrunde geht. Drum besser wär's, dass nichts entstünde. I am a part of that, I, I am the spirit that says no, I'm rightly. Everything that exists comes to an end. Better there should have never have been anything. Now, I'll, I'll repeat, just to pack that for a second. Um, by the way, I recognize that, that, I mean, here we are. I mean, good people all assembled in a nice bright room, you know, and they're not likely to be terrified by that. Uh, some night when you can't sleep, <laughs> sit on the edge of your bed and don't turn on the light and think about those lines from Goethe and it will scare you into the shooting release. Uh, I am the spirit that says no. Now, do you remember the New Testament? In Christ there was not yes and no, there was only yes. Well, this is the spirit and there's only no. No to what? No to everything. Is there anything valuable? No. Anything good? No. Any grounds for hope? No. Any reason to think things will get better? No. Any reason to go on existing? No. Well, am I worth anything? No. Well, are you worth anything, Mephistopheles? No. Is the whole thing worth anything? No. It's all garbage. Why? Because it comes to an end in the Germans of Grundigate. It goes to ground. It falls apart. It, it, it's finite. And if it's finite, if it's not God, then it's trash. And if it's trash, better there should never have been anything. It, you see, what Goethe recognizes so rightly from Genesis chapter 3 is that the heart of darkness, to use a good Conrad phrase, the heart of evil, is not pride. And it's not disobedience, it's despair. Is there anything valuable, worthwhile, or good? No. God is good, and if you're not God, you're garbage. Better that you should never have happened. And if I'm garbage, then I can treat myself as garbage. And if you're garbage, I can treat you as garbage. And out of that comes, in the Jewish and Christian tradition, all of the reality of evil. It's the denial of the goodness of, of creation. You see, it's, and, and it begins with the denial of the goodness of one's own creation. It's the refusal to believe that you are made in the image and likeness of God. Do you remember, we could go on about this a great length, and I won't, I'll just finish with this. Do you remember Genesis chapter 3? What's the first temptation? Eat this and you will be like God. What was the first thing we heard about ourselves in Genesis chapter 1? Let us make the human being in our image and likeness. You see, the temptation in chapter 3 is don't believe chapter 1. <laughs> the temptation is, you heard you're like God? Don't be ridiculous. You're not like God. And if you're not like God, then you better try and make yourself like God. And if you can't do it, Beta, there should never have been anything. That's the heart of evil. It's all about despair. Tom, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a great honor and a great